after Uganda quits the International Coffee Organization, producers in Africa's second largest coffee exporting country find themselves at odds with each other. Lifting up the next generation of Nigerian businesswomen at an entrepreneurship and skills acquisition program, the governor of Delta State reaffirms his commitment to empower the girl child. Sometimes seen as a sport for rich men, golf can carry an elite image. But in Senegal, one woman is staying up to challenge her country's conservative gender norms. Hello and thanks for tuning in to the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories now and far. I'm Joke Rogers at Channel's Television here in Lagos and I'm joined by Vincent McCory from Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent McCory at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Channel's Television in Lagos brings you that story. The Delta State government has empowered over 800 young women and ushered them into the world of business and entrepreneurship. This comes as the world continues to celebrate women throughout the month of March. Addressing the beneficiaries of the latest entrepreneurship and skills training program in Asaba, the state governor, Ifan Yokoa, reiterates his administration's passion for the empowerment of the girl child and the need to break the bias against women. Six months ago, the second cycle of trainees under the Girls Entrepreneurship and Skills Training Program began undergoing training in various skills. Over 800 of them are being ushered into the world of business and entrepreneurship with Governor Fanyo Okoa, his wife Dame Edith Okoa, and other government functionaries present to witness the formal handover of starter packs to the beneficiaries. As the second circle of Project Jazz beneficiaries. In her welcome address, the senior special assistant to the governor on girl child empowerment, Mrs. Marilyn Okoa Daramola, narrates how the second cycle, known as the Magnificent 900, scaled through the process of training till the end. Out of the 900 selected candidates, I present to you 814 passionate, powerful, dedicated and ambitious women from across our great state Delta who stuck through the process, maintained their focus and are here today crossing the finish line. Special Guest of Honor and Chief Executive Officer, House of Tara, Mrs. Tara Feladrotoy, urged the beneficiaries to build their businesses by leaving a lasting impression in the minds of their customers. I want you to go ahead and build your business so that it will last for a hundred years and beyond. Those who distinguished themselves during the training were also recognized and rewarded with awards and cash gifts. The package that will be given to you to commence. The governor speaks on the gains of the Girl Child Program. This is in tandem with the philosophy of jest, which is to tackle the issue of gender discrimination, poverty, any enforced marriage, identity crisis, social and parental pressure, poor life skills, and low self-esteem among our women. The ceremony also featured presentation of starter packs to the graduates. Those from the second cycle were trained in 10 skill areas including photography, videography, ICT website development and graphics design, baking and confectionaries, leatherworks, professional cleaning services, and even disc jockeying. Out of the 900 selected candidates, 814 beneficiaries across the state scaled through to the graduation. Joining us to discuss this is a child rights advocate, Joy Chinwoku. Glad to have you today on Africa 54. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> right. So you Delta State government is empowering women and girls. And of course, this is the month that we're celebrating women. And what, a, what more of a month to bring this kind of issue out. So do you think, what do you think of this gesture by the Delta State government to ensure that women and girls are placed on the right pedestal to survive in life? I think it's very laudable, the issue of uh, women 
girls' discrimination has been on the table for as far as I can remember. You know, so bringing it on at this time, especially when we are celebrating womanhood, is very timely. And um, I've looked at the the highlights of the program. You're looking at girls' discrimination. You're looking at uh, what they call biting. They call it a uh, crushing poverty, and then uh, uh, lack of social skills, parental and uh, social discrimination, among many others. So they, these are the problems they are trying to solve, and I think is uh, very, very good. And the one thing I like about it is that they don't just look at it as a program. Mm -hmm. They have developed a process. Yes. And the, with the end in mind of making sure that there's an impact, that we reduce poverty, that we reduce the... Um, put an end as much as possible to this social discrimination. So to that effect, I think it's very good. But I also look at the timing, six months, and I'm like, what can you achieve in six months? I don't know why they will say six months. I will say yes, because I happen to be um, a business development service provider. And I know that um, you, there's hardly much you can do in six months. If you want to make a real impact, Delta State should please consider making it years. Um, some of the skills they're trying to promote include uh, something like um, tailoring skills, fashion designing, hair making, and a whole lot of other things. And I know that our neighboring countries, the Francophone countries, spend years, which is why most of the time you see our designers going across the borders to shop for this hand. Perfect program, but please, they should give it the time it desires to make an impact. Right, so you, you, you brought up an issue, you know, that has been dominant in, you know, recent times, gender discrimination, uh, which is one of uh, the issues the uh, women have been fighting for, protesting at the House of Representatives uh, for days now. So how can we use programs like, you know, the Delta State government is doing, even though you feel that it should be extended, how can we use it to you know, erase these social issues and ensure that women can rightly stand on their feet and, you know, be their own? Okay. Uh, well, what comes readily in mind is the saying that if we empower a girl child, you empower a nation. You cannot just go to the National Assembly and make noise if you are not empowered mentally, financially, and in so many other ways. The people we have are the... National Assembly are women that are empowered by all means. So what Delta State is trying to do is to catch them young. Yeah. And they're targeting 18 to 30 years. Although I will hastily add that, please don't jettison the, those um, elderly ones because they still need your help. But mm -hmm. they're building a lot of, um, a lo they're, they're, they're building a lot of hope, a lot of skills on the upcoming youth. Mm -hmm. So when these youth, uh, young girls are empowered, and they become financially independent, and they become socially aware, and they can, um, they become very gender sensitive, and they can, uh, what's the other, other word they talked about? They develop their high self-esteem. Yes. Many of them have low self-esteem, which they're trying to address. So if they empower these girls to this extent, then they can key in, take over from where the people fighting the battles at the National Assembly are doing now, and make their impact. Um, I hope Delta State is doing it differently, which is why I'm saying, put time to it. Don't just groom them for six months and think they can perform magic. As a matter of fact, I would say Delta State should lead in getting other states to, giving them a model. And what Delta State should do is probably go to our Francophone, uh, Francophone neighbors that train people in Benin, Togo, Ivory Coast. Skills, um, skills programs, programs run for Six years, five years, enough time for you to get a, what is it called, a medical degree in Nigeria. But they take it very serious. But if Delta State can understudy these countries, probably take some of the, um, of the girls for internship in some of these countries, and actually go beyond the uh, skills to real entrepreneurship. Mm. Let them de become managers, develop managerial skills. Let them look at operational skills. Um, personnel skills that will enable them to run this industry. And then let Delta State become the model, become the destination for other states to come and shop for, for skills. All right. Thank you so much uh, you. for this insightful conversation. Uh, child rights advocate Joy Chinwoku, thank you for coming today on Africa 54. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. 
While Kenya has seen the percentage of people fully vaccinated against the coronavirus gradually increase to 19%, some people, like Zamadi Curtis, have been harder to reach. So Kenyan authorities offered an incentive. Hiders who get the jab can also get routine vaccinations and medicines for their livestock. Brenda Molina reports from Isiolo, Kenya. A chom ekeno is a harder in Isiolo, Kenya. Like thousands in this community, he does not believe COVID-19 is a threat or that he needs to get vaccinated. We don't know about this disease or its medicine. All we know is that it attacks people who appear fat and healthy. It is a disease for the rich. But for us, we don't believe in it and we won't take the vaccines. Health officials say Isiolo's vaccination rate was just 7% at the beginning of 2022 and that many other communities also have low rates. Local leaders and the Minister of Health attribute reluctance to get the vaccine to misinformation, religious and cultural factors and illiteracy. People are mis mis informed that if you take the vaccine, you will die after two years. And the vaccine is there to reduce the population of the black people. And some of those things made uh, people to be scared of taking the vaccine. Kenya aims to vaccinate 60% of its 55 million people by the end of 2022. Authorities say about 11 million people had been vaccinated by the end of 2021. While the country is making progress, the head of Kenya's COVID-19 task force says vaccines are going to waste because too many people are still reluctant to get the job. The main cause of wastage is lack of people showing up to take the vaccine. So the only solution to reduce wastage is strong social mobilization. In the counties of Isiolo, Marsabit and Moyale, Officials offered people in pastoral communities both the COVID-19 vaccination and medicines and vaccines for their livestock. It is working very well. And, you know, they are not resisting on, the, on their livestock. Hey, we are telling them, why do you value your livestock more than your own life? Hey, let the livestock get their, their treatment, their treatment, then you also do it. Hey, we follow them where they are. You know... Our people here that are uh, pastoral, so they move with livestock. Huh? But the program is currently on pause due to a shortage of animal vaccines and medicines. The Isiolo County Veterinary Department says it will resume the program when the inventory is restocked. Brenda Molina for VOA News, Nairobi, Kenya. In Nigeria's capital, Abuja, is a young female artist, Jacqueline Zouari. She makes life-size portraits at her studio using between 15 and 20 ballpoint pens for each piece. Zouari says she prefers realism as opposed to hyperrealism because she likes her lines to come alive. Human emotions take form in art as Jacqueline Zouari scribbles at her studio in Nigeria's capital city, Abuja. The 31-year-old Nigerian artist uses ball pens to create life-size portraits of people, which she says is a form of storytelling. Suwari started scribbling using the ball pen in secondary school and went on to study art and design at Nigeria's University of Port Harcourt. In 2014, Suwari abandoned her traditional art mediums and picked up the ball pen as a medium, which she says conveys her style better. I use this technique in my drawing called layering, in my shading called layering, and it's a metaphor for human experiences and how experiences layer upon each other to form a person's character. Suwari's new project is a five-feet art piece titled UFA that shows the defiance, resilience and fashion liberalism of Nigerian women. She explores various conventional themes regarding human interrelationships and expressions like anger, happiness, knowledge, mental health and more. People have a lot of suppressed emotions and this is something that I hope to bring you know, into realisation or into people's minds. The skilled draughts woman has created over 50 drawings and sells them to galleries in the diaspora. 
Soil worry takes between four to six weeks of shading, layering, highlighting and painting to complete her larger than life hollow pieces. My goal is to be able to shift people from how they think, you know, inspire them to think in a different way, inspire them to relate with us in a different way, you know, and hopefully, you know, spark this wildfire within society that will create a constant change. Swaware plans to include different art forms like sculpture as well as video and performance arts in her work in the future. It's time for a short break as we do remind you to visit our website channelstv.com for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. Still to come on the program, commuters in Dakar can say goodbye to haggling over fares and shortage of taxis. Senegal introduces ride hailing apps for French speakers. Welcome back to Africa 54, I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Uganda's decision to withdraw from the International Coffee Organization has led to a split among coffee producers in the country. Halima Athumani reports from Kampala on the controversy roiling Africa's second largest coffee exporter. Coffee farmer Robert Kavshenga in Uganda's Wakiso district is among the coffee producers who are upset over the country's decision last month to withdraw from the International Coffee Organization, or ICO. Uganda says tariffs and other barriers restricting its coffee exports triggered the decision to withdraw from the two-year extension of ICO's 2007 International Coffee Agreement. But Kapshenga describes the decision as reckless and illegal, telling VOA it will harm Uganda coffee farmers. How does that affect the farmer? It means that without that number, the coffee buyer who has been buying can only buy the coffee he can sell because there he's sure he has a contract. He's not sure he can take it to the warehouses in ICE. And because of that, we, can, we could quite easily end up with surplus crop here because there's no buyer. But the National Union of Coffee Agribusiness, Nucafe, which includes some 1,500 coffee farmers, supports the government's decision to withdraw. Executive Director Joseph Nkandu says farmers now have the opportunity to take ownership of their product and to invest and upgrade their coffee. The farmer has been getting far less than 5% of the retail value. Where does the 95% go? Okay? And the only way for this farmer to enhance the value that is getting from this coffee value chain is to upgrade. Uganda's withdrawal does not mean an end to exporting coffee, says the managing director of Uganda's Coffee Development Authority. Emmanuel Iamlemi says Uganda can now focus on promoting its coffee in other markets. We are looking at the specialty market. We have our young youth, our youth, our SMEs, which are looking at uh, entering big markets like United States, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, and of course the Scandinavian countries and Europe. IC officials say the organization has tried to resolve Uganda's complaints but has not received a response, adding that the reasons for the withdrawal were not strong or related to the agreement. ICO is looking at the integration of the private sector and the public-private task force in a new draft coffee agreement, says ICO operations head Geraldo Pataconi. This is a, is a new opportunity and this opportunity to me is unique. And I say that's why supported by donors and supported by industry. So Uganda is a leading producing of coffee. It, it's so sad it, it doesn't see that this as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And whatever concern should be discussed within. They say this is a coffee diplomacy. Uganda is the leading robusta coffee exporter in Africa, exporting 6.1 million bags annually. Halima Thmani for VA News. Kampala, Uganda. A French ride hailing app has been launched in Senegal, one of two apps to arrive in recent months to test a largely untapped market in Francophone West Africa. It's a great relief for commuters in Dakar as they put behind them haggling over fares and shortage of taxis in the country. 
Bhagwatambai had always taken taxis to a banking job in Senegal's capital, Dakar, but haggling over prices and inhaling fumes through the open windows every day wore her down. She was happy to leave all that behind when French ride-hailing app Heach launched in January. The ride costs a little more, but she considers it a small price to pay for the peace of mind. We are 3.0 generation. We are on the smartphone all the time. And the ability to anticipate taxi orders, because you can't find a taxi all the time as soon as you get off. I prefer to wait quietly at home or at the office, and as soon as it's there, I get out and there's no waiting time. Heach was the second company to launch a ride-hailing app in Senegal in recent months after Yango, which is owned by Russian tech giant Yandex. Both are testing a largely untapped market for ride-hailing services in Francophone West Africa, where the industry has been slower to take hold than in Anglophone countries like Nigeria and Ghana that have more vibrant startup cultures. Africa is a very young continent, where connectivity is very high. Everyone has a smartphone. Everything that is done in the country, in Africa, is done with a phone. Between sending money to a relative who is in another city, or talking via WhatsApp, Facebook, you can see that people are connected 24 hours a day. Hitch is coming into the digital world to modernize transport. He each said about 3,000 people have downloaded the application so far in Senegal. Yango, on the other hand, declined to provide figures. The companies are mindful not to antagonize taxi drivers when other countries have staged violent protests against ride-hailing apps and are trying to convince them that using the apps will save time and money. Dakar, a city of about 4 million, has a fleet of 25,000 yellow taxis, often old cars lacking door handles or seat belts. Oui. Working with a transport platform, I think it makes it easier. It increases the number of daily customers that I had before. Before, I could get two to three rides, but now, with the app, I get at least ten rides in a day. A few hundred taxi drivers have signed up for Heach and Yango, but others said they were unimpressed. Yango said that even if a driver earns less for a particular route, he would still earn more overall with the app by reducing idle mileage. Golf is sometimes seen as a sport only accessible to an elite few. But in Senegal, one female golf star is redefining the sport's image and challenging her country's conservative gender norms. Anika Amashlag reports from Senegal. When pro golfer Umi Jai first started competing against men, she felt intimidated. They didn't want to play with her, she says, and they didn't take her seriously. But then, in her first match, she won. After that, she had all the confidence she needed to keep playing and beating the boys. Now, as the only professional female golfer in Senegal, she competes almost exclusively against men. Now, I'm used to playing with men. I train in the morning, noon, and night. I'm in the gym three or four times per week, so that also gives me more confidence. Jai turned professional seven years ago. She's placed in dozens of competitions around the world, including in Thailand, Kenya, and South Africa. Her accomplishments are particularly noteworthy considering Senegal is a conservative Muslim nation where women are discouraged from participating in sports, especially at the professional level. When you're Muslim, we prefer to keep girls at home, to find them a husband and make them a housewife. In 2020, the Senegalese Golf Federation agreed to help Jai establish a golf academy in preparation for the 2026 Summer Youth Olympics in Dakar. It would be the first Olympic Games to ever be held on African soil. The project was postponed due to COVID, but it's expected to restart this year. Jai will be tasked with training Senegal's first ever national team with a specific focus on preparing the next generation of female golfers, including her daughter. The girls will be part of it, I mean, on an equal basis like boys, and, and that would be something that I think uh, we are prepared and committed to, to do. And Umi also uh, has that vision and committed to promote the girl, to give them opportunity as a girl, I mean, to, you know, help them get to the level that they can be. 
Jai says she hopes to find a sponsor so she can continue to compete internationally and bring the next generation of Senegalese female golfers into the fold. Annika Hammerschlag for VOA News, Sally, Senegal. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channels Television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Do remember that ChannelCV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Jocker Rogers. Thanks for watching and goodbye.